So I've got something called a supercharged 6% protocol variant. And we're talking about put protected call writing on leaps. Now, for some of you that have some experience, you might have an idea of what we're doing here. Some of you that are more into trading uh, stocks, commodities, indexes, and not so much into the derivatives market. This might be new to you. Uh, but before I begin, I do want to make sure that I um, visit. Uh, if you and just want to make sure I'm on the up and up here, if you visit 6percentprotocol.com, where you can go to my website here, uh, we've got down at the bot bottom, the investment risk warning and financial disclaimer. And that's always good to review before you start doing any sort of presentation. That way the uh, guys with black helicopters won't come landing on your front lawn. So if you have any sort of questions about any sort of risks around financials or anything like that, please visit the 6% protocol. Uh, you can get to it in many ways. 6%protocol.com, 6%protocol.tradingtrainer.com. You can spell 6% protocol out. You can put the number, do whatever you want to do, but that's where you can find out about that information. Let me just ask a quick question here. I'm going to switch over and look at some of you attendees here. Uh, I'm And just for <clears throat> your knowledge, Dan, I'm really good with GoToWebinar, so I'm not going to shut it off at the end of uh, the system. But one of the things I wanted to do is check in with you with your GoToWebinar system that you've got going on here, you might notice that up on the webinar control panel that there is an orange button with a white arrow on it. If you click that button, it'll actually move the control panel off of your screen and free up some valuable screen real estate because I plan to show you some drawings, some charts, some graphs, some tables. And the last thing I want you to do is have something in your way. So if you don't mind, press that orange button with the white arrow on it to get that uh, control panel off your screen. And what it's going to leave behind is a vertical kind of column of the most necessary buttons. So it basically makes a minimized view. And I'd like you to have that minimized view. And the other thing I'd like you to do is on that minimized view, that couple of buttons there, when you put your pointer or hover your mouse over those different buttons, little uh, tool tips, little ex explanations will come up. Find the one that says view in full screen and click that. That's going to make my screen take up your full screen. And that way, when I show you things, you're not going to have to squint or anything like that. Okay. The other piece of the puzzle that I'd like you to do is I'd like you to test out, because I like my um, webinars or any of my lectures to be interactive. I don't want you to just, um, um, I don't want you guys to just have, uh, you know, one way where I'm just talking at you for the next 40 minutes. I'd rather you be able to interact with me. And one of the ways to do that is to raise your hand. So on your little um, buttons there, there's a hand raising button. It's the one usually all the way at the bottom. If you don't mind, test out for me what it's like to raise your hand. I want to see if your hand goes up. Perfect. I see people raising their hand left and right. That's awesome. Fantastic. And so a lot of times I like to ask questions and I like to just see you raise your hand and participate there. So I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, yeah, check that out because, again, being able to... Um, interact with you that way with your hands going up and down really makes things useful. Just for first question is how many of you with a show of hands have ever heard of me before, AJ Brown? I've been around since 2003, uh, 2002, uh, working with folks. I started a uh, nonprofit where we help inner city kids get off the street by teaching them stuff about money, especially around trading and investing. And then I got went ahead and started doing the same thing for um, other folks. Um, and by the way, just out of curiosity, let me put your hands down here. How many of you have to show of hands? I'm completely new to you. Oh, fantastic. Well, let's have some fun here. <clears throat> A supercharged 6% protocol. So the whole 6% protocol thing that I kind of introduced to you is one of the options 
trading programs that I put together for people who want to do a little bit on the less side of trading. In other words, not be sitting in front of their computer every day inside and out, but want to focus on having their portfolio um, be big. And it's something that I started with myself in 2005. I put myself on a little bit of a program where I filled a Roth IRA with $2,000. At that time, $2,000 was the max. Now it's up to, depending on your age, around $5,000 every year. $2,000 and I just focused on 6% per month. And what's the special sauce around 6%? Well, let me go through a little bit of an experiment, and this will tell me who's kind of in tune and who's kind of new to this, and that is if you were given $50,000 today or a penny that doubles every single month, which would you take? Now, think about that for a second. We're talking about compounding. Somebody's writing into the Q&A area, compounding baby and you're absolutely right right just going to go through it very quickly here because this isn't the meat of my presentation but on day seven you're up to 64 cents most people are saying wait a second we're talking fifty thousand dollars but just wait already at day 10 we're up to five dollars and twelve cents now at day 20 we're still not up to our $50,000. We're already two thirds of the way through the month. But sometimes around day 24, we finally surpass that $50,000. We still have about six or seven days left, depending on the month. And the cool part is, is we could be up to $21 million by taking that penny. So a lot of you put into the Q&A area that you'd rather take the penny. And that's actually a smart thing. In fact, like we said, compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. We're not sure if Albert Einstein actually said that, but it's always attributed to him. So there you go. I actually got to see in the Q&A area, and I'm gonna shut the Q&A area down for my view because it distracts me. But I see somebody said, assuming you win every time. Interestingly enough, Mark, I don't know if you've gone through some money management type uh, discussions, but if you look at the actual successful traders out there, they focus more on money management than they do on their win loss ratio. In fact, if you look at a good money management, you could have a win loss ratio of only three out of 10 trades, meaning you win only three times and you lose seven times. And at the end of the year, you're still way ahead. So just a heads up for all of you, and this is something I focus on heavily, money management is where it's at, what you do with your winners and what you do with your losers. It's not so much about whether you are always winning or losing, because I have to tell you, the market is more like real life than it is like academia. A lot of us has been programmed in academia world where there's pass fail and They've moved the curve up, meaning that if you pay your money for education, you go and you pay for a higher education degree, you're going to pass. You just have to do cramming for studying and then you'll pass. But in real life, you know that everything could go right and you can still have things go against you. I'll say that again. In everyday life, things can go, you could do everything absolutely right and it can still go against you. Anybody who tells you today or any day that they have a 100% win ratio, please do me a favor, turn around and run the other way. They're feeding you a line. They're feeding you a product and they're making more money on selling you education than they are actually trading. Somebody wrote down in the Q&A area, hopefully they're doing better than 30%. Many success successful traders do not do better than 30%. In fact, if they're doing on any kind of New York's, if they're doing equities, 
on any sort of New York stock exchange, if they're doing better than 60 or 70 percent, I'd be surprised. And on a NASDAQ stock, if they're doing better than 70 or 80 percent win ratio, I'd be surprised. That's the top of the line because the market is always going to hand you rotten eggs. It's what you do with them. Can you turn lemons into lemonade? But I'm off on a tangent here. That's not what the whole 6% protocol is about. But please understand that money management is where it's at. But 6% protocol, if you do the math and you focus on earning 6% on your portfolio every month, at the end of 12 months, you will have doubled your portfolio. So that's pretty powerful if you've got, a, a, say for instance, an IRA that you're filling to the max. Because if you think about it, the first month, five thousand, or first year, $5,000. At the end of the year, it's $10,000. Add another five because you're putting in the max. You got 15, the next year it's 30. 35, goes to 70, 75, 150. By this time, you don't even have to put in the $5,000 anymore. By about year four, it's not even important that you fill your Roth IRA anymore. And what's exciting about the 6% protocol, because I've been running the 6% protocol program since about 2008, is you're more than a millionaire by the time that you've, if you just focus on making 6%, if anybody's done any sort of options trading, 6% is on the low side. It's an easily doable number and you don't have to sit there. You can use the components of options trading around premium. So that's kind of what we've been doing for years, but I want to talk about a variant. And that variant is kind of putting this thing onto steroids, really turbocharging our 6% protocol such that you're actually making closer to about 15, even 20% on your portfolio every month, completely doable. And that's where we find a substitute for the actual stock to lower our cost basis. So let me show you how to do that. And let me make sure I'm covering all my bullet points because when we have something called covered call writing, let me go ahead and kind of minimize, I'm gonna actually draw up a diagram here. Couple of the components here is, I'm gonna draw what's called a profit and loss diagram. What's nice about the covered call writing is that you can do one transaction for every expiration of your derivative. I usually like to do it on the monthly. And you can figure out your max returns before you even close the position. And so that's why we like the covered call. Why we don't like the covered call, and this is something that a lot of brokers won't even tell you, in fact, some of them don't even understand it, is that there is an unlimited downside. Meaning if the stock goes down, so does your covered call. I've had folks come up to me at the end of presentations, like live presentations. I remember one specifically back in 2007, where I just gave a live presentation about options trading. And he came up, he said, AJ, I have been really into this options trading stuff. I took somebody's course. And they showed me how to write covered calls. And I said, oh, fantastic. And he said, so I did it every month. Okay, the first nine months, I was easily making 10, 15% every month. I said, that's fantastic. And then he said to me, on the 10th month, something happened, the market turned against me and I lost not only all the money I made the first nine months, but I lost about half of my investment. Here's one of the keys that I have to tell you, and this is where we're gonna go with this presentation, and that is when you're doing any sort of trading, but especially options trading, there's a order that I want you to do things in. And that order is first, 
pattern recognition, I'm going to call it PR, not Puerto Rico, but pattern recognition, and then pattern utilization. So in other words, don't go learning a single option trading strategy. That's called a pattern utilization. That's your toolbox. Or don't go learn how to go long on a trade or short on a trade and then apply it every single time. It seems so common sense. Instead, be sure that you are first observing every single pattern in the market especially in the investment vehicle you're going to be trading and then pick the appropriate trading strategy to work with it. I have so many people come up and say, AJ, AJ, all I want to do is trade vertical spreads. I say, well, what if the market's telling you to trade something else? All I want to do is trade vertical spreads and that's a recipe for disaster. Make sure you're recognizing the pattern first and that the pattern matches what you're doing. So for instance, if I log into the trading trainer learning community, I'm just gonna go to login.tradingtrainer.com. Just wanna check in here. Somebody's writing down that the sound has stopped. Can you all hear me? If you can, raise your hand. Excellent. Okay, so one of the things that I want to point out, if I go to the 6% protocol trading tool, we have a screener that goes through all 7,000 plus securities that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ Exchange that are qualifying. And every evening it goes through all the variants of the options trading and it finds those patterns that are most likely going to be the ones that we can trade. And it compares them using it, what's called a buy right put protected or a put protected buy right. And it allows us to compare them simply by looking at them very quickly to even narrow it down further. Now we teach our folks, again, once you've got this list, how to screen it down even further. But again, that follows the same recipe, which is we want to make sure that the patterns we're looking at first match the option trading strategy, not the other way around. You can try to tell the markets all day and all night what you're trying to do but the markets aren't gonna listen. You have to listen to the markets, we're followers. Unless you've got a big enough portfolio that you can move the market. But otherwise, we wanna make sure you have something like a screener like this, or you put in the due diligence to find the patterns. Now I'm gonna give you 10 quick tests that I use once I've got a candidate that I'm interested in doing some of these different strategies on that I want them to at least show up on these tests, if not pass them. And I, I don't have, I have about 15 more minutes, so I'm gonna run through these tests quickly. If you have any sort of questions about these tests, I am going to give you my email address. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now. And you can write me personally about these tests. Just, I'm at AJ at tradingtrainer.com. Don't get those mixed up because I'm not at AJ at trainer trading. I'm, I'm a trading trainer, T-R-A-D-I-N-G-T-R-A-I-N-E-R.com, AJ at trading trainer.com. I'm going to run through these really quick. Number one, let's make sure that the Bollinger Bands on a 20 day are not compressing. We want to make sure that they're going nice and consistently across compressing usually means that we're going to get an unexpected movement in the not too distant first and that's not what we want for this strategy bollinger bands are not compressing and on the same vein i like to throw onto my charts the 10 day exponent the five day exponential moving average the 10 day exponential moving average and the 20 day exponential moving average and i want to make sure they're not converging same reason 
looking at the same quality from two different aspects. Also, I like to switch over and look at candlesticks because they're really no-brainers to look at. And I like to count them since the body, not the wick, but the body inside those 20-day Bollinger Bands is a large number. Again, I don't want to have any unexpected movements while I'm using this strategy. Candlestick bodies inside the Bollinger Bands. I actually like to be able to count, out, count back greater than 20 since I've been outside of the Bollinger Bands. The bodies, not the wicks. Let me stop right there. How many with show of hands are taking good notes right now? Excellent. Excellent. I see somebody on these with their hand up named Snoopy Dog. How exciting is that? I have the real Snoopy Dog on the phone with me. Number four, I like to look at just the naked chart. So in other words, no volume, no anything else besides either candlestick or I even like to go to open, high, low, close bars. And I like to characterize that just very quickly, not really staring at it, but looking at the naked chart. The best type of pattern I'm looking for, and I'm looking at six month daily charts, is a sideways mover. So if I've been going sideways mover, sideways channeling is what I call it. The fifth test that I like to apply is I like to look for clear support and resistance. Let's actually look at a chart. Let's find one that we can um, pull up here. I'm actually going to open up a, uh, a login using my Internet Explorer here. I'm just going to use the charting that's built into um, Assuming my fat fingers can type in my password. There we go. Use the charting that's built into just our learning community, but you can use any charting you want for this type of exercise. So we'll pull up a, a, a chart and take a look here. And I'm going to give you, uh, again, you could use any charting uh, package that you want to take a look at these components. Oh, exciting. I just got a message from Dan that I actually have an hour and 15 minutes. My representative that was planning this for me told me 45 minutes. So bonus, I'll spend a little bit of extra time with you. Take a look at Apple here. Now that's at the top of my list and Apple's been going sideways since about the end of March. Let's see if we can't find one that's a little bit more sideways. I'm just, I'm just going through my favorite watch list here, like Boeing. Boeing's got, if I were to just look at this naked chart, let's put it up on the candlestick so you can see it very nicely. We seem to have some sort of level of support and some sort of level of resistance. And I'm just eyeballing this. Again, I don't want to create something completely difficult for you here. With support and resistance, I'd like the levels to be tested more than once or twice. How about Bed Bath & Beyond? Bed Bath & Beyond looks like it tested the level at $40 one, two, three times. Tested the level at $38 one, two times. It looks like it's playing around that level right now. Maybe Bed Bath & Beyond would be a nice candidate. Just going to click through a couple other ones here. See if I can, and here I'm using my naked chart analysis. Wow, Caterpillar, that's been going sideways for quite some time. It just recently 
for the last five days popped out of that zone, although it looks like it's falling right back into that zone, maybe Caterpillar might be one to look for. So support and resistance, clearly being tested multiple times. And again, these are tests that I want you to be able to use very quickly. In my mind, I call myself a lazy trader. And the reason why I call myself a lazy trader is because I try to get the most amount of profit for the least amount of resources, meaning dollars, the least amount of my work and time because I have a lot more fun things to do than sit in front of a computer, especially on beautiful days like it is today, right? So I'm trying to give you things that you can evaluate quickly. Number six, I like to look at fractal patterns. Just very quickly, fractal patterns means do I see the same pattern not only on the six month daily, but do I also see it on the two year weekly? And do I also see it on the 10 year monthly? In fact, I could even go the other direction. Do I see it on the 30, 30 uh, minute, like weekly? So let's take a look at some of those. Just with Caterpillar, why not? Let's take a look at the weekly chart and go out to two, two years. Am I still seeing the same sort of sideways movement? Ideally, the answer would be yes. Looking at monthly 10 years, well, Caterpillar still seems to move sideways on the monthly 10 years between about $80 and 110. So again, is this a stock that tends to get stuck into sideways channels? Has it been doing that for the last 10 years? Has it been doing it for the last two years? Just like with people, how they do anything is how they do everything, right? All right. So fractal patterns is something I like to take a look at. I also like to switch gears. I like to look at something called point and figure. Now you can do that. Uh, one of the free places to go and look at point and figure is at stockcharts.com. I'm not suggesting you buy any of their service or anything, but if you go to stockcharts.com, they have a nice PNF point and figure chart. We could put in Caterpillar there too. They have a nice little charting app. Let me go ahead, since we have a nice large resolution screen here and see if I can't make this chart nice and big for you to look at. So again, with my point and figure chart, I ideally would want to see things going sideways. What's a point and figure chart? How many with the show of hands have familiarity with point and figure charts? How many with the show of hands? Point and figure charts are not something that's in your toolkit. I can't go on point and figure charts. When I learned the analysis methods around point and figure charts in the late 90s, I had the whole world open up to me. If you're interested in being able to see patterns that you wouldn't otherwise see on a price and volume chart, get yourself some sort of documentation around point and figure patterns. Again, this is off my presentation, but I can't uh, tell you enough how much I love of using point and figure charts. Now the difference here with point and figure charts versus a price and volume chart is a price and volume chart, let's move back to the price and volume chart for a second. A point and figure chart, a price and volume chart, every time we get a new candle, it means that in this case, a new month, but let's go back to our daily, each bar is a new day of price action. We've got a high, a low, and, and uh, open and close. With our point and figure charts, each bar or each column represents the amount of time since we've been 
seeing the last reversal, the last top, the last bottom. So you can see here on Caterpillar, they actually do put in reference for us the dates. So here's when 2016 started, here's where 2017 started. And they even put in the months. So the four is when April began, the three is when March, two is when February, one is when January began. C, of course, was December, B was November, A was October, nine was September, eight was August, seven was July. You can see here since July of 2016, that July was a very volatile month. We went down, hit a reversal, a bottom, came back up, hit a reversal, or actually the seven means up. So in June, we were coming up. At the beginning of July, we took a nosedive. Then we came back up in July, all the way here, hit August. August, there wasn't so much action and most of it was sideways. September, and then all of a sudden, October, and then it looks like that November was kind of, uh, October was a down month, and then November was a very high up month, and then December, January, February, very quiet months. But by looking at where the actual reversals and the tops and the bottoms are found, you get a whole new understanding about how this stock is moving. A lot of action in April, up action, and then down, and then big up. So we want to look for clear signs of support and resistance here on the point figure chart. The letters are representing not waves. The letters are representing months. So as you know, we have 12 months in our calendar, but because we use base 10 numbers, we stop at nine. Nine represents September, A represents October, B represents the beginning of November, C represents the beginning of December, and then we start all over January, February, March, April of 2017. And as you can see at the bottom of this chart, 2017 started on January. So I hope that answers your questions. So I like using point and figure charts because they can show me even better lines of support and resistance. So let's make sure we're jotting this down. Fractal patterns, point and figure charts. Let's look at number eight, another tool I like to use. You can tell here, by the way, that these tests are you are trying to make sure things are going sideways because sideways is a really nice way for these strategies and you'd be surprised at how many ticker symbols go sideways versus trend up or trend down so you'll find a lot of candidates for this sideways and also not compressing or converging because usually something that's been moving sideways and starts getting into a small tight pattern means that it wants to break out or up or down and that's not what we want to have happen. We just want one of those stocks that's happy going sideways and that it's got very strong support and resistance that we can see every which way to Sunday. So number eight, and it's something you can do again on this free tool here, is on the point figure chart, we can do something called price by volume. Let's just make sure. How many of you with the show of hands can still hear me? Excellent. And let me put your hands down here. Let me just ask really quick, is this useful? How many of the show of hands are learning something today? Excellent. Good, good. I like to train when I give these presentations. It's less for me about selling you stuff than it is for giving you something that's super duper useful. All right, notice that we've put the amount of volume of trades that have occurred at each price. The red, of course, stands for buying and the black stands for shorting or selling. And so this again correlates with, is there clear support or resistance? If there's been buying or selling at the edges of a channel, that is clear support and resistance. 
right? Because if you think about what support and resistance are, support and resistance are these psychological levels where people who have been trained their whole life to buy low and sell high, they say, oh my gosh, this particular candidate, Caterpillar, hasn't gone below $91 in a while. And every time it goes to $91, that's the lowest it goes. Hey, and they phone up their broker or they go to their electronic terminal and they put in limit buy orders at $91 because they want to buy low. And the same thing around here at $98 where we see all this volume, they do the same thing. They go, oh my gosh, we've come up here one, two, three, four, five times. And every time at $98, we don't tend to go higher. So that must be sell high. I'm going to call my broker or go onto my electronic terminal and I'm going to sell high. I'm going to put a limit order in there. Well, guess what? When you have all these limit orders at $91 for buying happening, it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. All that buying, if you remember your Economics 101, when you start buying, that raises the price. So it creates that level of support. That's why we like to see support tested many times because the more times it gets tested, the more people jump on to the idea that this is the bottom. Same with the top. More people who have limit sell orders waiting at $98, the higher the probability that when selling occurs, the price is going to drop. Makes sense? How many of the show of hands does that make sense? So we're looking to hedge our bet in every single way that this thing is going to get stuck going sideways between two numbers. So that's why I'm having you test it 10 different ways. And you'll see that if you start taking this little checklist that you're writing down with me and start applying it to some of these sideways moving stocks you find, you'll be able to <clears throat> filter out the ones that are, you know, less exciting and get the ones that are the low hanging fruit. Because if you're a lazy trader like I am, you don't want to always be watching the market afraid that you made the wrong decision. So number eight is price by volume. We want to see those levels of support and resistance play through here as well. Number nine, here's a, a mathematical one that I love to do, the mathematical test. Channel width divided by average channel price. Let me explain. So it looks like on Caterpillar, we found a channel most recently somewhere around this $91 zone where we saw it tested a couple times and the $98 zone, okay? So the channel width of this 91 to 98, and we can also probably see that. Let's go back to our price by volume. Let's uh, put a line here and see what it looks like because a lot of times you can see things in a point and figure chart that you cannot see in your price by volume chart. So here's $91. And then let's put a line up at 98 and see if they correlate. So again, I probably wouldn't trade this until we popped back down into this zone, but there's a high likelihood that this will pop back down into the zone. In fact, it already looks like it's going right. Probably looks like it had its earnings. Earnings were popular, but I'm telling you, market forces will probably bring this back into this zone. And when it's back into this zone, it becomes a candidate for my 6% protocol again. Okay. Let's go back to our point and figure. Let's go back to my last tests here. And then we'll talk about how to turn the 6% protocol into a supercharged trading strategy. Channel width, average channel price. So 91 to 98. The channel width would equal $7. So the math behind that would be $98 minus $91. So that's the channel width. Does that make sense? How many with the show of hands, you get how I calculated the width 
of the channel? How, do, how wide in dollars is the channel? How many with the show of hands? Let me put your hands down. Are a little bit confused. Good, not so many people are confused. So then let's talk about average channel price. The average channel price is 98 plus 91 divided by two. So the average of that channel is 94 and a half. Anybody have questions about how I calculated the average channel price? If you do, raise your hand. I'm just taking the high and the low of the channel and dividing by two. That creates an average. So now I've got the channel width over average channel price. All right, and that's gonna create for us a ratio or a percentage or a, a, a fraction. So let's do that math right now. So if I take my seven and I divide that by 94.5, I get 7.4%. So the channel width divided by average channel price. And I'm just keeping my eye on the clock. I don't want to spend too much time on these, but these are amazing analysis methods for determining if something is worthwhile for trading these 6% protocol strategies. I go into like hours and hours of this type of analysis over and over so that folks who subscribe to the 6% protocol know what I'm talking about, but I just want to introduce it to you. 7.5%. Seven point four percent. Now, ideally, I would like to see this number to between ten and twenty percent. When it starts to get smaller than ten percent, I start to get the heebie-jeebies, and I don't know if that's a regional term, uh, but that means I get a little bit uncertain. Okay. When it gets really small, below five percent, I won't even touch it. Makes sense? How many of the show of hands makes sense? This is going along with, I don't want something that is going to be tightening up too much because when a channel starts to tighten up too much, it tends to head towards a breakout, which is not what I want to have happen while I'm doing this trading strategy. I'd rather have it just go nice and calmly for years sideways. The final test I want to give you is just check if they have dividends. Why? Because when a company gives out dividends, investors are less incented for the company to have asset appreciation. In other words, investors who get dividends are happy and with, with a stock that just goes sideways. They don't need to, they don't put pressure on the company either through, you know, direct pressure or through buying and selling pressure to have their stock price appreciate. It's okay because they're getting their monthly dividends. They're making an income. So if you see that there's dividends on a particular symbol, then that gives you more confidence that it's okay that it's going sideways. There's not going to be as much pressure on the company to have their stock price go up. Okay. Also, dividends are a nice benefit if you are actually doing covered call writing because then you can also make money quarterly on owning the underlying symbol. All right. How many of the show of hands have these 10 tests down? Again, if you have any sort of questions about these tests, you can always follow up with me later, aj at tradingtrainer.com. But I want to move on here. I want to show you about now how we might trade this. Now, the traditional covered call would be that I'd go out and I'd buy a whole bunch of Caterpillar stock and I'd have to buy it in lots of 100. 
because I need to have a matching number of options to sell against it. So we call that an instant dividend. We also call it a profit buffer because basically what we're doing, if we pay, how much is, is uh, Caterpillar going for right now? Caterpillar is going for $101.35. If we pay, that much for the stock, then we can sell our call option as kind of a coupon against the stock and make an instant dividend. In other words, let's draw a picture here. When I buy a stock, If that stock goes up in price, I make profit. If that stock goes down in price, I can make a loss. By selling a covered call against it, I actually move the amount, the cost basis to the left by the amount that I make on the premium, how much I made by selling the covered call. So basically I've just, bought my stock at a discount. I made an instant dividend. And I've also given myself a profit buffer. If this thing goes down a certain amount, I'll be okay. Now, you can't get anything for free. And so what you wind up doing by making this decision is you wind up capping your profits at a certain level. Now, if we're dealing with a nice sideways moving stock, that's not a problem because the stock is moving sideways. So we're just going to be, if you will, we'll be, and you will, We'll be renting this stock out every month or every week because now they have weekly options, right? And that's kind of the whole idea behind this. But I want better returns, right? Even with the 6% protocol screener, I'm going to have to, you know, the screeners right now finding buy rights at somewhere between one and a half and 4%. I need better returns than that if I'm trying to double my money every year. How many with the show of hands follow? So we need to figure out a way to lower our cost basis. And this is where we're gonna come up with, we could play around with what's called synthetic equivalencies, but still even with the margin requirement, that's a little bit on the high side. So let me, let me give you kind of an understanding. Some of you with options experience already know this. But an option price, when you look at any price of an option, that price of an option has two components in it. One is called the intrinsic value, and one is called the extrinsic value. Now, those are academic terms. The common name for extrinsic value is premium or some people call it time value. I don't like that name because it's not just based on time, but you'll hear people talk about the time value of options or the premium of options. I like the name premium. I like the name extrinsic value. When you add these two values together, the intrinsic value and the premium, you get whatever the price of the option is, right? So the intrinsic value is the value of the option at expiration. It's when all of that emotional component, the hedging component of an option price has worn away. How many of you with a show of hands have heard that an option is sometimes called a decaying axe asset? What decays away is the premium. The intrinsic value is what is left over. What's interesting is when you look at the option price on a graph, what you notice is that there is a point, a certain distance away from the strike price where the premium decays away and all that's left is intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is the hard value of an option. It moves dollar for dollar with the symbol that it's on top of. So for instance, if Caterpillar goes up a dollar, the intrinsic value goes up a dollar. It 
if we go with an option that's called in the money, in fact, if we go deep enough in the money, for you guys that have experience with options, you're looking for a delta of one. For those of you that don't have experience with options, what we're doing is we're going deep enough in the money that this particular option is now acting one dimensional. It doesn't have the components of time decay. It doesn't have the components of volatility adjustments because people have buying and selling pressures on it. We call it being at parity, all right? We also wanna make sure that this thing is far enough out in time that we're not gonna worry about expirations and also putting it far enough out of time makes it so that the time component doesn't affect us as well. And so what we're gonna to do to substitute for that stock is we're gonna find a far out in time, deep in the money, call option that's going to be a fraction of the cost of the stock we're actually going for you again for you option folks out there we're going to create a diagonal trade for those of you that don't really care whether you're an option trader or not we're basically going to do right calls against a far out in time deep in the money leap so let's do that let's find some so again, I'm gonna give you free resources. If you ever were to sign up with us at Trading Trainer, we have some extra benefit resources that make this analysis a lot easier. But if you just visit the Chicago Board of Options Exchange website, and you can come over here and take a look at the quotes, the delayed quotes are free. Let's stick with that Caterpillar and just do some experimenting here. So I just typed in Caterpillar into the quote area and it's gonna give me all the options. And I wanna look at all the options, not just the near term options. So I'm gonna click on all the options. And so let's start with the one that we create as a coupon. So that's gonna be our near term option. And again, I stick, just because of liquidity purposes, I do this monthly and I use the monthly expiration. The monthly options have been around since Hammer was a hatchet. The weekly options, you could get into them, but my portfolio, I have to be honest with you, I've been doing this with my portfolio since 2005. My portfolio is too large. The liquidity in these weekly options doesn't cover it. So I stick and I do, plus, gosh, if it was weekly, I'd have to somehow move away from being the lazy trader and I'd have to do a lot more work than I want to. I just like to make money. How many of you at the show of hands just like to see your portfolio grow? You don't wanna be sitting there intimately attached to your computer. And I guess I should ask the opposite because there are a few of you out there. How many with the show of hands actually do want to watch your life go by by sitting in front of a computer all day trading? And there's absolutely some of you out there. <laughs> I love it. Fantastic, okay. This, this may not be for you because this, this particular, and I'll be completely honest, this is a little bit more on the hands-off side. But anyway, we talked about Caterpillar currently trading, uh, according to here, $101.41. So I would be looking at the May 19th, that's the next monthly option, and I'd probably be selling uh, the call option. Call options are on the left here. Looks like they're trading every dollar. So maybe I'd be selling the 100 or the 101. Um, I'd do a little bit further analysis on it, but I'd make something like 2.4%, uh, you know, cause again, assuming that the option's around a hundred bucks and we get a, if I were to do just a normal covered call, we'd make anywhere from about one and a half to 2%, two and a half percent returns doing this covered call for the month, yeah, that's not good enough. Plus, I have to come up with $100 times 100 shares, I'd have to have a $10,000 for every option contract because these options, they don't come singles. You have to sell them and buy them in lots of 100. So I'd have to buy 100 shares of stock in order to just sell one contract of these options against it. So. I wanna figure out a way to buy something else instead of the stock that's cheaper. I still wanna sell this particular 
either this one or this one or maybe even this one. Still want to sell this option and do what I usually do, but let's use that synthetic equivalent. So let's go all the way down to the bottom and let's click on, get this, I'm going all the way out to 2019. It's called the 2019 leap. And some of you might say, well, why aren't you using the 2018? Because I've been known when I pick my stock using these 10 tests, I've been known to get as many as 14, 15 months of being able to sell premium against these underlying symbols. And when you get about three or four months towards the underlying leap, it's time to actually liquidate the leap. So if you think about it, to, what is it? It's, it's May. So we've got our June, our July, our August, and our September, maybe our October. We have maybe five to six months we can do this before the 2018 leap would have to be liquidated. I'd rather be far enough out in time that I could do this for the next year and a half. Does that make sense? How many of you have to show of hands that makes sense? So I go as far out as I can, and then I need to go deep enough in the money. And I see my time is starting to tick down here. I want to give you enough time here to ask me some questions. So let's look at the 2019. Let's make sure that I not just, the CBOE likes to default to show me just a few options, and I want to see them all. I want to go deep in the money here. And I'm not saying that Caterpillar is the stock du jour. I'm just using this as an example today because it's just happened to be there. But we said that Caterpillar was trading at $101 right now. Let's look at something like the 60 that we talked about going far out in time. And we talked about going deep in the money. 60 is pretty gosh darn deep. Let's do a little test. Now, some of you that know about your Greeks, you'll just go and you'll look, at, look up Delta and you'll see if it's close to one and then you're good to go. For those of us that aren't like experts at options, let's just do a little test here. I'm gonna give you another math test. How many of you with the show of hands are ready for another math test? And again, I go through this in depth with my 6% protocol folks. So I want to determine what that intrinsic value is. And the intrinsic value is easy to calculate. Just take whatever the stock price, or it doesn't have to be a stock. You could do this on ETFs. You could do this on indexes. You could do it on anything that's optionable. You take the symbol price, and you subtract out the strike price of the option. So if we're at, what do we say, 101? 101.43, and we come over here to our 60, and we're trading between 39 is our bid and 43 and a 55 is our ask. So I'm gonna take the halfway point. Thirty nine plus forty three point five five divided by two. So about $41.30. If I was to put a limit order in at 41.30, it would probably get filled for me to buy some of these leaps. This is a fraction, by the way. This is about four tenths of, a, of what it would cost to buy the underlying stock. So if the leap is at leap, price equals $41 and let's just round up to 30 cents. The strike price equals $60 and the stock price, and I keep forgetting, so I'm gonna have to look at it again, 101.43. So to determine the intrinsic value, we take the symbol price and we subtract the strike price. So the intrinsic value in our example is going to be 101.43 minus 60. 
4143. And now what you want to do is you want to compare that to the leap price. The leap price is around 4130. Remember that picture I drew. We want to go far enough in the money that there's no more premium or extrinsic value left. The equation, like I said, is that our option price is equal to the intrinsic plus the premium. And I want to get far enough deep in the money where the premium's nil. Am I there? I'm going to show you and say I'm close enough. Absolutely. I'd be happy using the 60 leap. Now you could go ahead and try to get closer. You can find out where all of a sudden where we start to see some premium show up and go right below that. But it's always good to put a safety buffer of $5 or a, a certain percentage. And I go over that again and I just, I'm towards the end of my time here. So just give yourself some zone because you want to be able to make sure this thing goes up and down, up and down, and that the leap isn't going to take on any sort of premium value. But now if you think about it, we were talking about selling the call option, the May 19th, let's go ahead back to May. We were talking about selling the May 101 or May 100. Let's go with the May 101. Make sure we're using the May 19th. The May 101 is somewhere between 174 and 181 right now. About a dollar seventy-seven, a dollar seventy-eight. If I were to round up and put a limit sell order on there, I put a dollar eighty. When we were talking about doing a covered call, we were talking about a dollar eighty divided by one hundred and one dollars. We're talking about making about one point seven percent between now and May nineteenth. But if we're talking about a dollar eighty on forty one thirty, talking about an instant increase now four point three percent. Now that doesn't even include timing the purchase and the selling of the leap and the stock and the call. So in other words, we like to, if we're in a nice channel, we like to try to purchase our symbols, our leaps towards the bottom of the channels. And you can purchase the leaps at any time. You don't have a certain timing. And then we like to sell our calls within one or two weeks of the next month. So we just had on April 21st, the end of the April series. So this week or last week, we would have wanted to try to sell the call. In fact, if we would have purchased our leaps, even over here in the middle of April at the low, this would have been a perfect time to be selling our call option right before it starts to decay back down. So when you start to put in the actual timing of these trades, we start to easily make our 6% protocol. In fact, most of the folks this past couple of months have been pulling 10, 12% on their portfolios, using our money management and making sure that we're not putting ourselves into too much risk. We find that we put ourselves into about three or four different positions per month, not 10 or 12. We don't have you in front of your computer monitoring 10 or 12 different positions. Usually you can figure it out how to get yourself into about three or four different trades per month. And if you do find these sideways moving trades, it reduces the amount of research you have to do every month because you're just going to be evaluating the same position that you've been in for the previous months. Should I stay or should I go? How many of you with a show of hands have any kind of expertise with running some sort of business? 
Which do you think is better? And this is for all of you, not just for the business owners, but the business owners should get this right. Which do you think is better? Trying to work with existing customers or trying to find new customers? Who thinks existing customers are the way to go? Who thinks, no way, I'd rather always go looking for new customers? Exactly. So the scoop is, is we're looking for existing customers. That's why it applies exactly to stocks as well. Would you rather be always researching new candidates to trade against, or would you rather be working with the candidates you've already been following and intimate with? I'm all about low hanging fruit and being lazy. So I wanna put it out there that the 6% protocol is an awesome program and especially when you start doing these variants. So this is a diagonal, oh, I apologize. I have about, what, I think Dan gave me seven more minutes. I have until 1210 uh, Eastern time. So here's the scoop. Somebody said, well, what do you do about what you talked about in the beginning? You talked about the unlimited risk on covered calls. So we have different strategies and I actually have a sample portfolio where we've had stocks go against us. It all comes down to money management and the money management tells you what do you do with your losers. Some of these dog is in the background. Gotta mute yourself out. Woof, woof. All right. So the scoop is, is when you start to build in a lot of extra profit, when you start to build in a lot of extra profit, because you're using a lower cost basis like the leap. You can now use what's called protective puts, which limits your risk considerably. So a protective put, if you were looking at the profit and loss diagram, it would basically put a floor as to how much you could lose. That means your return on risk goes through the roof. So we use a lot of protective puts. I don't have much time left, so I'm just gonna give you in my notes here, protective put, go a couple of time slots out. In other words, if we're selling the May call option for premium, let's use the put that's out in June, July, maybe even August. The reason is, is because you will be finding times where you might want to have the protective put more than others. And so what's nice about that is, is if you go out with an August protective put, say for instance, it's around earnings season or it's around the time when dividends are released or something like that, you may want to put your protective put in place. After the fear is passed, you may want to take it back. When you go a couple months out, maybe three months out, three time frames out, you'll be able to sell that put back and recover a good portion of the value you paid for it. It's a lot different than, for instance, the insurance we get on our house where they give you like a 30-day period where you have to have the insurance before they'll actually cover you. With the put protection, the put insurance, we can add it and subtract it whenever we want and only pay for it on a per-use basis. So we talk about in the 6% protocol, the selective uses of the protective put. We also like to have strategies where we put automatic trading on the underlying symbol should the proverbial poop hit the fan, or if it was Dan, our host, he'd use a couple of other four letter explicatives, which we all love. We would automatically get out of the underlying symbol. And yes, the broker would then do a margin requirement, but we would have the cash in our account to cover that. And in our leisure, we can come back and buy back for almost nothing. Because if we actually did go down as low as we had to, 
that call that we sold, we'd be able to buy it back for like pennies, whatever the market maker would want to sell it to us for. So those are some different strategies. I wish I had more time to cover those, but come join me at the 6% protocol.